Thank you, Brenda. It's a little loud. Good morning. Welcome to Madison campus. Yeah, you are more awake than people in the first service, that's for sure. That's good. I like it. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, we also would like to welcome our internet viewers. Uh, as usual, or not as usual, I won't ask you to stand and sing. Not yet, not just yet. But I'll ask you to stand. But instead of singing, I'll ask you to spend a few minutes greeting the people sitting next to you. But listen, these are coronavirus times, so don't, don't shake hands or stuff like that. Just do like that. Happy Sabbath. Okay, try that. Why don't, why don't you do that? Let me see. <laughs> but you should stand, people. Good morning, kids. Time for story. So look around, see if you see any dollar bills hanging around, and bring them on up.
All right, I'm going to tell you a story about me. So I like cars. I don't know if anybody else likes cars. I like tall cars. I like fast cars. I like shiny cars. And when I was a kid, I kind of still am a kid, but when I was younger, um, I liked Hot Wheels cars. Anybody here like Hot Wheels? Yeah, I like Hot Wheels. So I liked the trucks, but I especially liked the fast ones. And I had a friend in my neighborhood, and his name was David, and he was quite a bit older than me, old enough that he was sometimes my babysitter, and he had some cars. And he had this one car, and it was silver and shiny, like chrome shiny. And what was special about this car is, you know how some of the cars, they don't roll very well? They kind of get bent, or they roll to one side, or they roll to the other side. This one rolled straight, and it rolled fast. To this day, it's still the best rolling car that I think I've ever seen, and I wanted that car, and it was his. But I wanted it, so I took it. I didn't ask permission. I stole it from him, and I didn't tell him. And so when I would have it at home, and then it was time to play cars, I'd get it out, and I would play with it. And it rolled great. It rolled fast. But it wasn't very much fun, because it wasn't my car. And so sometimes when I would play cars, I wouldn't play with it, because it kind of made me feel bad, because I had somebody else's car. So I finally got up the courage and I was able to tell him what I had done that I had stolen his car and he forgave me and it made it fun again and it was amazing because it was so hard to ask him for forgiveness and he forgave me so easily and it made me think that when we do things that are wrong and we feel really bad how God is already ready to forgive you. As soon as you ask, he he was ready already. It was no problem for him. And how much better I felt after something as little as stealing a car and how much better we can feel when we ask for God's forgiveness. So the next time you do something wrong or steal somebody's car, (laughs) make sure you ask for forgiveness. You'll feel better. Good morning again. Happy Sabbath. It's now offering time, and if the deacons can come forward. Uh, Today, our emphasis will be on our church budget, and as a way of reporting, uh, you folks were very generous to the church budget and returning your tithes in the month of February, so thank you very much for that. Uh, This is our regular offering, and so all the loose offering will go towards church budget. Today, at the end of the service, the deacons will be in the back to collect a special offering for the Middle Tennessee Emergency Response Fund. This is a fund that used to help to defray some of these expenses uh, that the storm victims are having and to help with any kind of disaster response here in the Middle Tennessee area. So please uh, remember that uh, at the end of the service. We bow our heads now for prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the bounty that you provide to us. We we thank you for the comforter that you send, the Holy Spirit, uh, in these times of trouble. We also thank you for the spirit of volunteerism that we have demonstrated daily in this 
great state that you have provided for us and the people. I ask you to be with the families who have lost loved ones to the storm and for all the families and the people experiencing loss of property. Be with our church and help us to be a shining light in your community. In Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Raising the next generation of worship leaders here. <laughs> now is that time, so I will ask you to stand up and raise our voices together to the Lord as we sing, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Good morning. When children are young, some of the first phrases we teach them to say are please and thank you. Please and thank you are important not just because they're polite words, but also because please indicates that you are requesting something of someone that you know that you can't do for yourself. And thank you is important because it indicates that you acknowledge that someone has done something for you out of the graciousness of their heart. So today, we're going to do something a little bit different for prayer time. I want us to give God our please and thank yous today. And we will have a corporate prayer in just a moment, but before we do, in light of what's happened this week with the, the tornadoes Monday night that brought so much devastation and destruction and loss to our community and our state, I know that many of you have individuals or neighbors or co-workers that you know that have suffered some type of loss this week that you know personally or that you've touched through volunteering. There's so many of you here that have volunteered through the academy and through the 403 Center and just individually on your own. So what we would like to do is at the end of your rows are pieces of paper, if you can pass them down so each one of you has a strip of colorful paper. Um, I'm going to ask my helpers to come up. I have um, extra pens if you do not have one. Um, raise your hand if you need a pen, and we'll have someone bring you one, and then maybe just hand it back to them when you're finished with it. What I would like you to do is on one side of that piece of paper, write a thank you to God for some way that he has provided some, way, some provision of safety or hope or, um, or help during this past week. And maybe it's um, in light of the storms um, and the tornadoes, and maybe it's just something personal, a way that God has provided. So a thank you to God on one side of that piece of paper. And I want you to flip it over and then write your please to God. Uh, your prayer, asking God to please provide something that you know that you can't provide for yourself or someone else that has suffered something this week. Asking God to be what we cannot be for ourselves and that only he can fill and do for us. When you're done writing your please and thank you on each side of the paper, pass them to the aisles. You see a lot of nice young people and their families um, here waiting to take your piece of paper. And we're going to take your individual thank yous and pleases and prayer requests to God, and we're going to combine them into a collective prayer chain, um, like we've done here at first service, and we may move this up onto the platform. Do you guys want to do that? Can you grab this, Aiden and Ashley, and drape it on the platform so they can see it maybe? Can you reach? So that we as a community are binding all our prayers and thanks to God into one unit and thanking him for the ways he's provided this week and asking him to help our friends and neighbors who are still suffering, many who are still without electricity and without basic needs and are going to take a long time to recover. In the next minute or so while you're writing those and sending them to the aisles, um, to those waiting to connect them, I want to make you aware of a couple things. Um, our own church family um, had members that were hurt in this, or their home was hurt in this storm. Um, Mike and Tammy Battenberg lost their home and their vehicles. They live in Hermitage and um, pretty much lost everything. Um, our church family would like to reach out and help them. So tomorrow morning at 9, 8, starting at 9 a.m., there's going to be a work beat at their home um, to help clean up. Um, their yard, and I'm not sure all the projects that will be done, but if you are interested in helping um, Mike and Tammy Battenberg and our church to reach out to them, um, please contact Pastor Ken or Chris, Chris Fuentes. Pastor Ken and Chris Fuentes are heading up that project, and you can get in touch with them for details. One other thing I want to mention as you're sending in your prayer request, um, one other prayer request that just came in. Um, some of you um, may have known a, a former um, president of Advent Health System, Don Jernigan, and he um, just passed away this morning. So please keep his family in your prayer as well. And we will give just another minute or so while the music plays for you to send your, your praise and thanks that we can combine as a church family together.
connect all of them together so all our thank yous and praises to God are connected as a family brought together before him. Just a thank you to all those who, who have served this week. Not all of us can take care of the whole world or help a whole community, but each one of you can reach out to someone and even if you don't have time to do hands-on tangible things for them, you can give them um, encouragement and a hug and let them know that God is with them and pray for them. And thank you to those of you that have served um, in volunteering this week. We're going to just lay these prayers up here and then pray together as a church family. And you can just lay the extra papers up. Perfect. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you corporately as a church family, as a community that has um, this past week grieved for the losses that friends and neighbors and people that we don't know um, but we feel connected to because of um, just our community and that they're families and people that are hurting with loss of homes and loss of life and loss of belongings. And we thank you, Lord, that you are God who sees every prayer request written on these pieces of paper on this prayer chain. We thank you that you're the God who can do the things that we cannot do to bring comfort and hope and, and healing. And we pray that you will help us know how to be your disciples on this earth, to be your hands and your feet, to do what we can to relieve suffering, to show love and grace and mercy in times of need. Um, we thank you, Lord, for the safety you've provided for so many of us and pray that we can rally around um, the Battenberg family and, and those that are still recovering. We thank you, Lord, most of all for your gift of grace and you, your gift of life on this earth and dying on the cross for us. And we're so grateful that you've promised us a home in heaven where we will never have suffering or tragedy or loss again. We love you, Lord, and um, just thank you for our church family in this time together of worship. Amen. just about run out of uses for her till I cooked up one more one final humiliation and then uh, you know maybe if we were lucky two birds and one stoning see I'd set the whole thing up I'd, I'd set her up I'd set him up I mean there was no denying what she had done what she deserved I had studied the law my entire life, and I knew that there was only one right answer. So we demanded it of him. But he ignored us, at least at first. He stooped and started to write something in the sand with his finger. 
But the law, you see, the law is written in stone. The law is unchanging. It is immovable. What say you, we demanded. Eventually he stood and said, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. And he stooped and he continued writing. <laughs> what? What did he say? I was furious. I was indignant. I reached back and I grabbed the first thing that I could find. A stone. Who is this man? Who does he think that he is? No one is above the law. This is unforgivable. I reared back. And then I saw it. He knew. He knew, he knew about me. About her, he knew about us, he knew all of it, everything. It's like everything that I had ever done was suddenly just cast out into the light for all to see. And I, I, I couldn't move. I could barely breathe. It's like everything that I had ever done was a million stones now raining down all around me. I could hear him pelting the ground. And then I realized it wasn't, it wasn't just in my head. There were stones falling all around me, including the very one that I'd held in my hand. So, I looked up, and I caught his gaze, and I ran. I ran. I ran for days. I ran for years. I ran to things, to things I wish I'd never done, to places I wish I'd never seen. And all I managed to do was want to run further and further away from myself, from him, from the way that he looked at me. And then one day, one day, finally exhausted and just covered in the filth of my own making, I looked up. And there he was. Same look in his eyes. Arms outstretched. Forgiving me. And it was in that moment that I finally understood. I got it. I knew for the first time in my life. And I took it all in like a desert drinking in springs of living water. I experienced healing and restoration and joy and freedom all at once and over time, too. The kinds of things that only a prisoner would understand upon his release from a lifetime sentence. The warmth of the sun on my face for the first time. Every time. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name, for He is a forgiving God. feels a little bit uh, unnatural after a week like this one to say happy Sabbath. We know that not far away from us there are a lot of people who are hurting. That this is not a happy day. That they are recovering from um, pain that hopefully none of us will have to deal with. So today it touches my heart to look down and see the, the prayer chain, to see physically what I know has been happening this week in this church, that our prayers have been joining together for our community. 
and what does my heart even more good is to see that prayer is a good thing, but real help is a good thing as well. And to see all the, the physical ways that this church is reaching out and helping also touches my heart. Prayer is, prayer is the most important. And I'm happy to see that we're also putting prayer into action. I see the, the supplies that have been brought in today. They're going to join uh, a truckload of other uh, supplies that have been brought to the 403 Center. As we speak, there are people there um, accepting donations from our community. We've already taken one uh, truckload of goods down to the main distribution site. Um, I was, uh, had the privilege of being there when that, they were offloaded and just to hear the people thanking us and saying, oh, thank you for collecting this and bringing this down. This is going to make a difference. I want you to hear that being said, too, because what you've done uh, during this week has made a difference. I'm proud of Madison Academy getting out the last two days and, and helping clear, um, helping to clean up. Uh, that's a big thing. I'm really proud of what, uh, what this community does and what God inspires us to do. So I am very grateful for that. This, the next five Sabbaths, we're going to be doing a sermon series on forgiveness. Our theme for the year is Thrive. And if there's one single thing that I can think gets in the way of thriving more than anything else, it's a lack of forgiveness. It's a heart that can't let go of pain and hurt. With that said, it's hard to let go of, of pain and hurt. When we've been w deeply wounded by the people we care about in our life, it's hard to let go of. And so in that spirit, we want to do a five-part series on, on how to forgive so that you can truly and fully thrive. Today's uh, will be the first part in that series. Next, the next two Sabbaths, Pastor Chelsea will be preaching on how to forgive yourself and then on how to forgive others. Then after that, uh, we'll have Communion Sabbath, which by the way, we will only have second service on Communion Sabbath. We want to do communion together as an entire family, so only second service, no first service on that Sabbath. Um, and on that Sabbath, we'll be talking about accepting God's forgiveness. How do you go about accepting and what does that look like to accept God's forgiveness? And then the final Sabbath, we've left to talk about one of the truly hard things. How do you forgive when you can't? What do you do when you can't forgive something that's been done? Some of you have probably been there in life, had something happen, and you just could not find a way to forgive. You may have kind of wanted it to happen, but you, you just couldn't. It's too hard. So we're going to talk about that on the final Sabbath of this series. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you. We want to love you better, and we want to be more like you. Lord, as I share this sermon today, I pray that you would speak. I pray it would be your words that come out of my mouth, and I pray that your servants in this place would hear what you have to say. We pray that in your name. Amen. So as you look at the screen... Hopefully, here in a second, we'll uh, have uh, it pop right up. There we go. Um, as you look at the screen, how do you read that? How do you read that? I want to suggest to you that as a Seventh-day Adventist, how you read those two words is going to have a massive impact on your ability to forgive. There are two different ways, at least two different ways, that you can read those words. You can read them and say, I need to forgive God. How do I go about forgiving God? Or you can read it as, he's a forgiving God. Which one came to your mind first? Which did you think of? Because I want to suggest to you, it really matters. It's going to have an impact on how you go about forgiving. 
There are a lot of people in the world, and a few of us, if we're truly honest and look into our hearts, that think God may owe us an apology. It's not hard to think that some of the people not too far from here might want an apology from God this week. Over two dozen dead. The destruction of homes and businesses. I mean, if you want to start thinking about the total cost of this disaster, let's just talk about one piece of property, John C. Toon Airport. They've already estimated it's going to take $93 million to repair that one property. And then think about all the damage that's been done besides there. That's a lot of damage. And in an insurance business, they call it a, an act of God. And there's a few people, maybe more than a few, that say, you know what, God, you owe us an apology. How do I forgive God when I'm really, really angry at him for allowing this to happen? Well, what about if you were this guy? There's a guy that had siblings that actively disliked him. What if you were him? What if you had siblings, maybe you do, that actively dislike you and put you down? What if you have a father who's dismissive of you? What if you had to wait 15 to 27 years for God to keep his promise about your career and what you were going to do? And what if during that time period you were hunted by the government with the intent to kill you if they caught you? How would you feel about God if your best friend died tragically? If you had a spouse that criticized you for how you served God? How would you feel if one of your children murdered several of your other children and that same child made you lose your job and then tried to murder you? And finally, how would you feel if God didn't allow you to do what you wanted to do most? If all those things were true of your life, how would you feel about God? Well, the man that that's true of, King David, wrote this in Psalms 32, verses 1 through 2. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. You see, the interesting thing about King David, who all those things are true about, was this. He wasn't bitter at God, and he didn't feel like he needed to forgive God. Rather, he felt joy in the fact that God had forgiven him. When God selected David, he called him a man after his own heart. And I believe that the reason he did that was because David shared the same attribute that God has, forgiveness. David was a man after God's own heart because David was able to forgive and forgive and forgive. He forgave his own son who tried to murder him. He forgave people who cursed at him. He forgave King Saul who tried to come after him and murder him. Read through the story sometime. Read through the story of David and what you are going to see is a portrait of a man who forgave constantly. And I want to suggest to you that the reason why he was able to do that is found in Psalms 32, verses 1 through 2. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. 
David did not view himself as the forgiver, the best forgiver in the world. He viewed God as the best forgiver ever. Philip Seidel in Pain Magazine, January 2015 edition, wrote an article called Spirituality, What Its Role Is in Pain Medicine. In that article, he wrote something that I found incredibly interesting. He wrote, It has been demonstrated that those who who are experiencing pain and see God as forgiving and kind have lower pain intensity and are higher functioning as compared to those who see God as harsh or abandoning. So you see, your picture of God The way you read those two words, forgiving God, matters. If you view God as forgiving, it actually helps you manage the pain in your life. But if you see God as harsh and mean-spirited and unkind, it actually hurts you. They've done a lot of studies on this. And what they've found is is that church attendance doesn't necessarily mean that if you're in the hospital, you're going to have a better experience, you're going to experience less pain. What they've determined is, is the way that your church views God will show you whether you have a better or worse experience in in a hospital. If If your church views God as mean, vindictive, out to get you, you would be better off being an atheist as far as pain management goes. But if your church, if your concept of God is that He is loving, merciful, compassionate, you are far better off than unbelievers when it comes to what your pain management is like. Our view of God makes a huge difference. How many of you grew up like I did? And maybe how many of you parented like I did? When your child makes a mistake or when you made a mistake, your parents said to you, Say you're sorry. Anybody do? I I did that to my kids. Anybody have your parents do that? Say you're sorry. And then, when you say you're sorry, they say back to you, I forgive you. Right? The more I've thought about this as I research this sermon, the more I think that this is pretty damaging. Not because anybody's trying to be damaging. But the problem with this is it's the wrong sequence. Biblically speaking. What we do is we teach our kids, you have to be sorry before you can receive forgiveness. Before forgiveness is offered, you have to be sorry for it. But family, that's not biblical. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says something very different. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Did you hear that? God didn't say, Say you're sorry, then I'll send Jesus. Rather, he sent Jesus and said, I am offering you forgiveness. Do you want it? There is a vast difference, family. A vast difference. There is the earned forgiveness, and there is the forgiveness that cannot be earned. And the Biblical one 
is you cannot earn your forgiveness from God. It is a free gift. God did not wait for you to say, I'm sorry, to say, I am extending forgiveness to you. If you don't believe me, what about the Roman soldiers that pounded nails in Jesus' hands and feet? Did Jesus say, say you're sorry and quit pounding those nails? No. Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. You see, there's a lot of different ways we get hurt by people. There's times that people hurt us very intentionally. They mean to do it. Then there are times that people hurt us, but they didn't mean to. And then there's times when we're hurt when nobody really did anything. But I'll tell you this. Forgiveness is the same across the board. For any one of those, forgiveness biblically gets extended before the person says, hey, I'd like that. Hey, I'm sorry for that. I would like to define forgiveness for you this way. Forgiveness from a biblical standpoint is the openness to the restoration of relationship. Notice I said the openness. I didn't say forgiveness is a restored relationship. Restored relationships are a two-way street. It takes two people to restore a relationship. But forgiveness from a person who's been hurt is the openness to that relationship being restored and made whole. It is the letting go the letting go of anger, hostility, and the desire to get even. The choosing to let go of anger, hostility, and the desire to get even. Now, a few of you right now are beginning to feel a little angsty because you're like, oh, I feel pretty bad because I'm angry, I'm hurt. So I'm a bad person because I feel those things? No. Look, pain is not bad. It's not a sin to feel pain. If I were swinging a hammer and I connected with my thumb, there's no sin in me saying that hurt really bad. Now what comes out of my mouth might be a problem. My reaction could be a problem, but the fact that I'm feeling pain is just natural. It's not something I can help. You hit your thumb with a, a, a hammer, it hurts. And when we're betrayed by people that we care about, and even the ones we don't care about, when we're hurt, it's not wrong to feel angry and hurt and upset. What becomes wrong is how we handle it. When we hurt back and we, we try to get even, that's when we have problems. Forgiveness does not mean, though, that there are no consequences or that you have to forget what happened or become a doormat for bad people. That's not what forgiveness is either. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to forget. Because in some cases, that's dangerous. It also doesn't mean that when there's forgiveness, that there are no consequences to that. God forgave David. He extended that forgiveness to him after he had a man murdered and stole his wife. God extended the forgiveness to him before David even asked for it. And when David accepted the forgiveness that God gave to him, there were still consequences for what he did. Consequences don't mean that we haven't forgiven somebody. So what about receiving forgiveness? 
Accepting forgiveness means a willingness to restore the relationship that may include acknowledging that we have caused hurt and pain and having a willingness to change. You know, so many times when we talk about accepting God's forgiveness, we act as if there's nothing to do on our part but say, I accept it, thank you. But if God has, has put forgiveness to us, if he's extended forgiveness to us, offered it to us, and if that offer is the restoration of relationship, then what that means is we have to do our part to restore the relationship as well. Accepting forgiveness means that there have to be some changes sometimes. If I know that I'm saying something that's painful to you, it means I need to stop doing that. And not just be like, well, you got to forgive me. That's what the Bible says. Yeah, I do have to forgive you, but I don't have to keep putting myself where you're going to keep hurting me. I have to be willing to allow you to restore the relationship with me, but that if you're not willing to do what it takes to restore that relationship, to make it healthy, then all I can do is offer that to you until you're willing to do that. Family, our mission at Madison Campus is to love God, love people, and serve the world. And forgiveness is all about love. David wrote in Psalms 38 these words, Yet God was merciful and forgave their sins and did not destroy them all. Many times he held back his anger and did not unleash his fury. In the Hebrew that the Old Testament was written in, there are at least three different words for forgiveness. The word that's used in Psalm 78, yet he was merciful and forgave their sins, is an interesting word. The reason it's interesting is because it can also be translated covered. Into English, it can be translated covered. So I could read it, yet he was merciful and covered their sins. Think about that for just a moment in the context of Jesus' parable about the man who was invited to a feast and was given a garment to put on, to cover himself with, but refused to put it on. God's forgiveness covers us. The same word that's used here in Psalm 78 is used to to describe the mercy seat, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant. I think that Peter was thinking of these verses when he said in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers forgives a multitude of sins. Whenever I've read that verse before, I kind of thought, oh, so if you love somebody, you kind of overlook a lot of things. Maybe there's some of that to it, but maybe also what's important is that when love is expressed, it forgives a multitude of sins. And what that means is it's open to a relation, restored relationship for somebody who's been trying to pull out of the relationship. Jesus always takes things to the next level. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 46, he takes the Old Testament and he takes it up a notch. And he says, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, and that way you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even ta- uh, corrupt tax collectors do that much. Jesus is asking us to take our love to the next level. He's asking us to extend forgiveness to the unforgivable. He's asking us to extend forgiveness to those who have hurt us the worst. He's asking us not only to forgive them, but to be open to a relationship with those people. 
Have you ever noticed how the attributes of love have a lot in common with the attributes of forgiveness? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, Paul describes love. Love is patient and kind. Sound a little bit like forgiveness? Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. You know, so many times with our kids, when we're teaching them about forgiveness, we're all about demanding that they change. And then I'll forgive you. The incredible thing about God is he does not demand his own way. In other words, he doesn't force people to do what they don't want to do. You get to make up your own mind. And think about how much that has cost God. Love is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. You can know that you haven't forgiven somebody when you're happy that something bad happens to them. When you say that served them right, I hope they learned their lesson. And yes, family, that has come out of my mouth. And I imagine it's come out of some of your mouths as well. Love never gives up. In other words, forgiveness is not something that we offer out and then just retract when the other person says, well, I don't, I don't think I did anything wrong. Forgiveness is extended indefinitely. The opportunity for restored relationship. Love never loses faith. It always is hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. You know, Peter thought he was doing pretty good when he thought he was going to forgive three times. And Jesus goes ahead and, I'm sorry, seven times. Jesus says, no, no, 70 times seven. In other words, don't, don't bother keeping track. You just got to keep forgiving. And Jesus then tells the parable right after that of the unforgiving servant. This, this servant who is unwilling to forgive. Even after the king forgives him a massive debt. The guy owes a billion dollars. And then he goes out right away and grabs a hold of the neck of a guy who owes him 50 bucks and says, hey, pay up right now. You see, that forgiving God thing, if you don't think you're such a bad person, if you think you're a pretty good person, if you don't really think that you've been forgiven that much, then you're not going to be willing to forgive much because you're a pretty good person and the world's vastly unfair to you. It's something that Dr. Fred Luskin, who wrote an amazing book called Forgive for Good, Stanford researcher, calls the grievance story. It's the story that you tell yourself over and over and over again. It's the story you can't get rid out of your mind of that person who did that thing that time and this is how they did it, and you go over that story over and over. You know people like that, right? Every time you're around them, they tell you the same story about how they were wronged by this person or that person or that organization. They tell you that same story and they go over it again. You hear it. You can almost repeat it. Guess what? There are people who can tell you what your story is. You might want to ask them. Most of us have those stories. It's a grievance story. It's one that we hang on to and that we don't let go of. And the problem is, is that when we, when we don't believe in a forgiving God who's forgiven us much more than we could ever forgive anybody else, then we see no reason to forgive other people. Because I'm pretty good. And the world is doing me wrong. You know, in, this, in, this, in the little skit that Abner did up front, we see the story that's, that's told about the woman that's caught in adultery. It's found in John chapter 8. This woman's brought before Jesus and, and thrown down on the ground. They're trying to trap Jesus. Jesus writes in the sand. They're ready to stone her. They're ready to, they're, they feel self-righteous until Jesus starts writing in the sand. And whatever it is he wrote there changed their minds about things. Not a single one of them was willing to cast the first stone. Ellen White connects that story with a story found in Luke chapter 7, where a woman comes and anoints Jesus' feet. 
Ellen White tells us that the person, that woman was the same woman that had been caught in adultery. And that Simon, the giver of this feast for Jesus, was actually the man that Abner was portraying up here. He had actually dragged her down to where she was at. And then he was willing to throw her away. And Jesus tells him, says, Simon, who, who do you think is more grateful? The person who's been forgiven a little or the person who's been forgiven a lot? Silence. So I guess probably the one that thinks he's been forgiven a lot. And Jesus in Luke chapter 7, verse 47 says this, I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Let me ask you this. Ellen says something interesting. She says that it was actually Simon who was, had the greater sin. He actually was a greater sinner than Mary because he had drawn her into it. He had greater guilt. So then why was it that Mary was more grateful? It's because even though Simon had had the forgiveness extended to him, he'd never accepted it and taken it. He would never accepted that forgiveness, so he hadn't been forgiven because he didn't want to be forgiven. He didn't think he'd done anything that bad. Church family, the, the problem with the I'm okay, you're okay thing is this. When we don't realize how sinful we are, we don't think that we need Jesus very much. And we think, I'm a pretty good moral person. Well, I know I went out and volunteered to help out with the tornado relief this week. I go and volunteer every week. I show up at church. I pay tithe. I'm a pretty good person. The problem with that is that when we go and we look for Jesus, we don't think that he's that great because he hasn't really forgiven us that much. The problem with this is that we forget that every time I say I want to do things my way and I don't want to do things God's way, every time we choose that, that sin creates a barrier between us. And, it, and let me tell you something. It was Ken Weltmore's sins. If none of the rest of you had ever sinned, it was Ken Weltmore's sins that put Jesus right here. And when Jesus was right here, he was willing to die for all eternity for insert your name here. Your sins put Jesus right there. They put him where he was willing to die forever so that you could choose whether you wanted to accept his forgiveness or not. So you could choose whether you wanted to have eternity. He was willing to give up his eternity. So you see, we serve a forgiving God. While we were yet sinners, He came here. And when we lose track of the fact that we're not that great, that we have murdered the Son of God, that should change our lives. It means that when you hurt me, I think to myself, yeah, but man, I've been forgiven a lot. How could I not be open to the possibility of relationship with this person again? A person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Christ has extended an ocean of forgiveness to you, how much of it have you accepted? Because it will influence your ability to forgive. And forgiving makes a big difference. Fred Luskins in Forgive for Good tells us that people who hold a grudge that it's hazardous to their health. 
People who are forgiving have less stress, fewer physical symptoms of stress, reduced depression, reduced risk factor for heart disease. People who blame others for their problems have higher incidence of illness, such as cardiovascular disease and cancers. But think about this. People who imagine, just keep this in mind, just, just, they didn't, people who imagine forgiving their offender show immediate improvement in their cardiovascular, muscular, and nervous systems. Just imagining forgiving somebody helps your health. And the other thing Fred will tell you is that unforgiveness is an absolute block. Keep in mind, this is a secular researcher. This isn't, this isn't a pastor researcher. This is a secular researcher at Stanford who will tell you that unforgiveness is an impediment in a spiritual life. Kind of what the Bible says. It's time to get rid of your grievance story. I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying that you weren't hurt. And I'm certainly not saying you don't deserve to be angry. But it's time to get rid of it. It will be good for you. It will be good for your physical health. It will be good for your emotional health. And most of all, it will be good for your spiritual health. This morning, if you came here thinking that God is in need of your forgiveness, take another look. Look at all that he's forgiven you for. Look at the love that he's shown you. It's time to view him as a forgiving God. It's good for your health. It will help you thrive. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love to us and your mercy. Help us to be forgiving just like you are, so that like David, we can be men and women after your heart. Pray these things in your name. Amen. There will be deacons at the door that will be taking up an offering. That offering is going to, or the uh, Middle Tennessee Emergency Response Fund. It's a fund that's been set up uh, to help with relief efforts all throughout Middle Tennessee. Um, and so if you want to donate to that, you can put a check in an envelope and put it in the bucket. You can put cash in. Uh, you can leave your credit card. We'll run it to its max. Um, whatever you want to do, but uh, please do that. And uh, if you felt, if you kind of left here today going, okay, you didn't really tell me how to forgive people, Pastor Chelsea is going to be talking about that coming up. So you just got to come back to church. God bless you. Have a great Sabbath.